Hi folks, welcome to the weekend once more. And let's see what the week has had to offer from a science fiction point of view. As usual, first up is what I have been reading this week. I read Fractal Noise by Christopher Paolini. It's a prequel of sorts to To Sleep in a Sea of Stars, which was his chunky space opera from a few years back. They share a universe where humanity has begun to colonise the nearby stars with corporations leading the charge. And the book focuses on the small crew of the survey ship Adamura as they look for exploitable resources in the Talos system. When they arrive in the system, their sensors immediately detect a regular signal from the seventh planet. On closer inspection, the signal is found to be emanating from a perfectly circular hole of uncertain depth, 50 kilometres in diameter. Clearly, neither the hole nor the regular as clockwork signal are natural. But is anybody home? Our protagonist is Alex Crichton, and he is grieving the recent death of his wife, and frankly is in no shape to be on a survey mission at all. And after a lot of arguing, the crew decide to send a party of four down to the surface to get a closer look at the hole, and of course Alex is included. Due to the extreme electromagnetic pulse of the signal, they can't land too close to the 50 kilometre hole, and the rest of the book is essentially the away party slogging their way across country in the teeth of a near hurricane force gale. And for all of their high-tech gadgetry, their journey is old school, in the style of an Antarctic expedition. They are on foot, dragging sledges behind them with all the kit necessary to survive in a hostile environment. They continue to argue as they go, but are all somehow compelled to continue on. Paolini does a good job of building the sense of claustrophobia and the growing privations of the mission. The signal is audible too. The sending of the signal every 10.6 seconds makes a booming thud which gets louder and louder as they get closer and closer. And if you're looking for a study in claustrophobic paranoia, grit, mental breakdowns, pain and suffering and an eventual and I do mean eventual, redemption, then this might be the book for you. If you're, however, looking for an actual plot or anything much happening at all, apart from arguing pain and endless slog, then perhaps you might want to give this one a miss. Next, I return to Ken McLeod's Fall Revolution with the Cassini Division, uh, which was published back in 1998. This is the third book, and I think it's the one that I've enjoyed the most. The Cassini Division is charged with defending humanity from the transcended post-human AIs that live on Jupiter now. Their powers have in the past extended to building a wormhole and collapsing the moon Ganymede for their own nefarious purposes. They habitually send, or perhaps just leak, virus after virus, whether they're cyber or visual in nature, which can have devastating effects back on Earth and elsewhere in the inner solar system. For hundreds of years, the Cassini Division has held the line, defending humanity from whatever emanates from Jupiter or from the nearby wormhole. In this post-scarcity world, quite reminiscent of an early small-scale version of Ian Banks' culture, longevity treatments mean that our main protagonist, Ellen Main Ngwethu, has hundreds of years of experience. She has formed the opinion that humanity needs to come to a final solution to the Jupiter problem, believing that the post-humans are now so advanced that they may not recognise humanity as life, never mind intelligent life, whether out of malice or lack of awareness, we are as ants to them, or so she firmly believes. There are a number of strands to the plot. We get flashbacks to earlier times, and then there's an away mission to Earth to recruit Dr. Malley, a physicist who may be able to help the Cassini division unravel the secrets of the wormhole. I enjoyed this section as it was set in and near a much-changed London, which has been left to grow wild for a few hundred years. There's also the unfolding plan to end the Jupiter issue and last-minute negotiations to prevent it. And on top of that, there's a journey to New Mars, an accidental colony formed by employees of the post-humans who fled their service a couple of hundred years previously via the wormhole. There's a lot to like in this book. It has satisfying links to the other two books. It is of a piece, uh, but without being joined at the hip. And there's a nice look at a post-communist, post-scarcity, anarcho-socialist society that has developed through throughout the solar system, and an even briefer glimpse at some who have opted out, so-called non-co's or non-cooperators, who, who have regressed to an agrarian, almost subsistence level existence, and that's the way they like it. I enjoyed the concept of the post-humans, the AIs of the piece, that whose planetary scale processing power is such that they live at an accelerating pace. During the negotiations, a 10 minute delay in response from the humans has seen two years of development on the other side. This feeds into Ellen's paranoia. I also enjoyed the time skips the wormhole generates. New Mars is 10,000 light years away, so 10,000 years in the future, effectively. It was very good, and I'm looking forward to reading more of Ken McLeod's books. And maybe I'll do a collection overview at some point, so I have quite a lot of his stuff now. I also took the plunge and invested 99p in a three-month Audible trial. 
I was getting fed up with the 15-hour monthly audio book limit on my Spotify subscription. For my first book, I've chosen Red Rising by Pierce Brown. I'm maybe halfway through at the moment. I do also have, as you can see, the physical book, uh, which was kindly plucked off my Amazon wishlist by Bruce over in Canada a month or two back. What's that you say? Where can you find the Amazon wishlist of which you speak? There is a link to it in the description of this very video, so knock yourself out. Talking of Bruce, he sent me uh, a postcard the other day by way of a belated birthday wish. Thank you again, Bruce. My daughter was very excited to bring me some fan mail. She said, now I just need death threats and I'll know that I've made it as an influence. And she's 15 and she knows about these things. Anyway, back to the audiobooks. To my usual running listening combination, I'm finding that I can also listen whilst doing a bit of gardening. So that will add an hour or two of listening to my week. I don't think it'll ever replace the joy of reading an actual book, the heft of it, the physical connection. But as an auxiliary method, a sneaky way of adding a book or two a month to my reading pile, it seems to work pretty well for me. Back in the physical realm, I have made a start on another book, Early Riser by Jasper Ford, but I'm only about 20 pages in. So I shall say no more about that. At present we'll catch up with that one next week channel stuff next then subscribers are at 2690 which is up a modest 19 on this time last week if you're one of those 19 or if you have just stumbled upon my channel today then a big welcome to you i'm john and i focus on reading collecting and discussing science fiction books old and new Comment of the week was from Michael Schubert, who left a comment on my sales pitch for Empire of Silence last Sunday. He wasn't convinced, mainly on the basis that Hadrian Marlowe must be a big softy for wanting to negotiate with the aliens. Michael, he says, is a child of the Cold War and would have just nuked them from orbit. I had a chuckle. That would certainly have been more efficient for Christopher Rocchio from a writing point of view. To be fair, whilst Hadrian does think negotiations are a chance at peace, we know that he does eventually burn them all to a crisp in a supernova. So, you know, he certainly toughens up over the course of the series. Thank you, Michael, and thanks to all of you that take the time to leave a comment on my videos. I enjoy reading them and I try to respond to everyone. Let's take a look at what was on the channel this week. On Sunday, there was that aforementioned look at why you should all read Empire of Silence by Christopher Rocchio, a book that I very much enjoyed a month or two back. I had it in mind to continue with this or something like it as I read the other books in the Sun Eater series. This video, though, had relatively low views and I'm now calling into question that approach a little bit, but, but let's see. On Tuesday, there was a page-by-page -page look through Hardware, the definitive collection of Chris Foss artwork. Foss was ubiquitous on UK science fiction covers in the 1970s and 1980s, and many of my earliest science fiction reads had his work on them. This was another video with pretty low views, though, uh, perhaps one for the true fans. Yesterday saw a sort of reverse book haul, an unhaul, a keep or chuck exercise as I tried to make room on my shelves. It was somewhat successful in that I ended up with a worthwhile pile of books to sell and a bit more space on my shelves. I have plenty of other shelves to consider, so there will be more of these videos, four or five perhaps, in the coming weeks. Viewing wise, I still haven't watched any more Three Body Problem and I'd also like to catch Fallout on Amazon Prime, which I hear is also pretty good. But a typical week for me is just pretty jammed with reading and video stuff, not to mention the rest of life, you know, work and stuff. Uh, and so I'm finding that I just don't have time. On YouTube, however, I did catch a few things. I chuckled at Pulp Morton's massive haul. He had like five minutes to grab books in his local enormous used bookstore, ending up doing a sort of supermarket sweep, armfuls of books going into his shopping trolley or cart if you were in the US. I would have paid money to see the panicky book buying itself, but we did get to see the resulting haul. There is a second part, which is live on his channel now too. I also watched Whitney give some book recommendations using TV shows as the prompts. If you like this show, then you might like these books, that kind of thing. I was mainly struck by how much science fiction TV there is out there and how little of it I've seen or could see, given that much of it is behind a paywall that I don't subscribe to. Anyway, there are plenty of book recommendations to see in that video. You should take a look. I also watched an interesting video comparing the 1984 Dune movie to the recent Villeneuve movie or movies, uh, or rather comparing what happens when two directors adapt the same book. That was on a channel that I've never watched before run by Archer Green. It's a well-established movie channel, so it might not be your jam, but I enjoyed the Dune comparisons. As usual, I'll leave the links for all of those in the description to this video. Talking of links, during the week I got an email from Matt Charles letting me know about his book, To the Brink. Matt is a Stanford astrophysics graduate and has been using his knowledge to inform his writing here. In the near future, to the brink plunges us into a world teetering on the edge of chaos. 
Following the riveting journeys of Rob Ranter, a determined miner, Maria Delgado, a fearless test pilot, and Kenneth Hyde, an elite SEAL, as they're in, that's a military seal, not like an actual seal, as their lives intersect against the backdrop of a warming planet and rising global tensions. Rob's struggle against a controversial water pipeline spirals into a deadly conflict, propelling him from the mines of Michigan to the vastness of space. Maria, after a daring aerial battle that cements her as a combat ace, finds herself on the cutting edge of space warfare technology. Meanwhile, Kenneth's covert operations unravel a web of international intrigue, leading to a desperate mission in the cold vacuum of space, and so on and so on. I haven't read it, so I obviously can't vouch for its merits one way or the other, but it sounds exciting. I'm always happy to support new science fiction writers, and I'll put the link to his book in the description to this video if you want to take a closer look. Good luck with your sales, Matt, and with the next book. On the book buying front, I've been relatively well behaved with just a few books added to my haul pile here, although to be candid, there are another five or six arriving tomorrow, and I might make a trip out to a charity bookshop of my acquaintance. In my defence, I am also shipping books out, so it's not all one-way one traffic, although it's kind of like rush hour. The flow of traffic is mainly in one direction. Such is the life of a magpie book enthusiast. I'm not accumulating too many, though, so I'm still on track for one book haul a month, and, and I'm aiming for early May for the next one. Looking ahead to this week on the channel, then, subject to me getting my act together, there will be a look at what science fiction has to say about the Fermi paradox. Are we alone? That probably will be on Sunday, possibly Monday. On Tuesday, there will definitely be a look at two books that I've read recently that have some similarities structurally and thematically, namely On by Adam Roberts and Inverted World by Christopher Priest. I compare the opening gambit, the premise, the protagonists, the world building, the physics of it, you name it. On Thursday, I am clearing my schedule to celebrate my one year anniversary. Yep, one year on YouTube already. Time flies when you're having fun. That will cover some vital statistics, popular videos, lessons learned, plans for the future, that kind of jam. Reading-wise, I shall finish Early Riser and possibly Red Rising, and then I don't know what. That is the last of the books that I picked for April, so I'm free to choose something else. Could be the next Sun Eater book, could, could be something from the vintage end of my collection, or something in between. I shall see how the mood takes me on the day. If you enjoyed this science fiction diary, then let me point you to something else that you might also enjoy. And as always, thank you for watching, have a splendid weekend, and until next time, goodbye for now.